Good morning, everybody. We're so glad to have you with us. Would you please stand? We're going to sing again the song we taught you last week, New Creation. Let's celebrate who we are in Christ. I thought I knew what I was talking about When I testified of your great love Well, I was a soul on fire, there was no doubt Bible believed and saved and washed in the blood But it was until I stumbled And I made my mistakes that I could know In my soul how amazing was grace you brought me blessings out of a tragedy. You turned my old song into a symphony. And with your spirit living inside of me, I'm a new creation. I'm a new creation. And now I know. My soul, how amazing was grace. You brought me blessings out of a tragedy. You turned my whole song into a symphony. And with your spirit living inside me, I'm a new creation. You brought me blessings out of tragedy. You turn my old song into a symphony. And with your spirit living inside me, I'm a new creation, a new creation. I'm a new creation. I'm a new creation. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O oh Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. tries to roll over my bones when sorrows come to steal the joy I hold when brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken no I won't be shaken cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. I am not a captive to the lie. I'm not afraid to leave my past behind I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance When I stand in your love My fear doesn't 
and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you with compassion, love and power. Come ye thirsty to the fountain. Come and find his goodness here. Believe true repentance, every grace that brings you near. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me as his own. And in the arms of my Savior, there is life forevermore. Come ye thirsty and heavy laden, lost and ruined by the fall. If you wait until you're back, you will never come at all, so I will, I will arise and go to Jesus, He will embrace me as His own, in the arms of my Savior. us. 
you may be seated. Um, at this time, we're going to dismiss our children, aged kindergarten through third grade, to classes designed specifically for them. They can go out the back doors, and there are people waiting to catch them there and show them the love of God. We're grateful for that. Well, my name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here. It is my privilege to welcome you. If this is your first or first couple of handful of times being here, um, I hope you've already been greeted and made to feel welcome by our body. Um, and uh, we would love to meet you specifically at one of the connection tables in either lobby. If you'd go there, we'd love to meet you and hear your story. We have a gift for you, and we'd love to explore how we might become a, a part of what God is doing in your life. Uh, I have a, a, several announcements to make this morning. Um, first of all, uh, we've had a number of new families join our church recently, and we're very grateful for what the Lord is doing. Um, and uh, there is the possibility that perhaps you are new-ish to the body and you are musical and we have not yet met you and your talent. So if you are an instrumentalist or a vocalist or a technician and you would like to explore what it would, like, what it would look like to be a part of the worship ministry here at Pleasant View, please contact the office and uh, let me know and I'll arrange a time to meet with you and hear you do your thing and we can talk about uh, you becoming a part of, of the worship team here. We specifically need guitarists. Um, guitarists are, are the, uh, the low point in the pool right now as far as the number of people that we have. And so if you play guitar, I need to be your friend. Um, there is that. Uh, the next thing, uh, if you have uh, considered the possibility of becoming a foster or adoptive parent, um, that is a, a central huge rock in my heart is connecting needy children, vulnerable children to the body of Christ. Um, I would love to talk to you about that as well. We're going to be having a Q&A here on campus Saturday morning, April 9th at 9 a.m., um, and there will be representatives from DCS here to talk about what it looks like to become a foster parent or to become certified to adopt from foster. And so if that is something that you uh, have been considering, um, we'd love to have you come Saturday, April 9th at 9 a.m. and hear more about that. Um, we also have an opportunity to bless the body of Christ in the Ukraine. And you know what's going on there is horrible. Um, there is a missions organization called the Marcel Fund, and the Marcel Fund is a, um, a missions organization that normally uh, blesses disabled and elderly Ukrainians and provides in-home care for, uh, for people in a gospel context that need some help with their day-to-day -day life. But in the context of the war that's been going on, they've been uh, taking care of way more than their normal clients, and they are reaching out to displaced people um, and doing the best they can to provide uh, hygiene necessities and food and shelter and things of that nature. So their, their cost of doing business has gone from one level to a much larger one, and we are going to be stepping in and helping raise some additional support for that missions organization as they endeavor to bless displaced people in the Ukraine. So um, we're, going to be, uh, we're going to be collecting a special offering for the next two Sundays on March 20th and the 27th, and we will be sending all of those special offering funds straight to the Marcel Fund to help them help others in Jesus' name. If you uh, would like to give to that special project, please note on your check that you would like to give to the Ukraine. Um, or if you are giving through Tithely on the app, there is a, a, an op opportunity for you to select uh, the Ukraine as a place of where you'd like the, your monies to go. I will take this opportunity as well just to remind you that we, um, if, if you do not specify in your giving, where you would like your money to go when you give to the church. It just goes to the general fund, and our general fund has been doing well, and the Lord is a blessing, and we're grateful. Thank you for your gifts. If you would like to give to any of our special projects, the building fund, the deacon fund, or the missions fund, you do have to specifically say that on the memo or in the app. Um, and uh, this is just a reminder because at this particular point, our mission fund is a little bit lean. Um, and so if you would like to be contributing to our missions efforts around the world, you have to specify that on your gift. Okay, there you go. Um, and then lastly, VBS is coming. It is not summer. Can you tell when you go outside? Not summer yet, but summer is coming. The last week of July, July 25 to 29, here on campus this time, VBS will be here from 6 to 8 p.m., 
And so we are beginning our appeal to those of you who would like to be volunteers to help us put on VBS. We're praying for hundreds of kids to come and have a great time learning about the Lord. The theme this year is Making Waves, and the VBS spends a couple of weeks talking about what God has done in their life, and then like throwing a rock in a pond, what happens in one place affects the things around it, right? As the waves go out, we want them to not only know what Jesus has done for them, but to be inspired to be used by the Lord to make a difference in the lives of those around them. So um, that's the impact uh, and the point of VBS this year. If you are available that week, we would love to, to meet you and talk to you and tell you more about what that looks like. At this time, we're going to have uh, pastoral prayer. So Terry and I talked because we were switching. I couldn't remember. I was thinking we switched and it was next week and this week, but you're right. It's you today and I'm next week. <laughs> we got a lot of plates to spin up here and uh, it's a big job. Uh, just last month, uh, my wife and I participated in 30 hours of advanced training in personal ministry. Uh, two hours of that training was dedicated to instruction in using lament. Uh, using lament in our own soul care and helping others that we are helping to use lament in their suffering. Now, a lament is a prayer in pain that leads to trust. Uh, we're all familiar with the Psalms, but did you know that roughly one in three Psalms are laments? And uh, the Psalms are full of someone crying out to God in their pain and suffering, asking God for his help, and then choosing to trust God and have confidence that by his grace, he will do something. That's the concept of lament. I say all this because as we prepare to pray this morning, I want to read to you one of the lament psalms, uh, Psalm 10. If you want to turn there in your Bible or on your uh, device, Psalm 10. Uh, this psalm will be the bulk of my prayer this morning. It seemed appropriate because of the current geopolitical turmoil, especially between Russia and Ukraine, that has so captivated our thinking in recent weeks. We're all angry, uh, we're disgusted over a Russian president and his army wreaking havoc and death over the lives of millions of neighboring civilians who just want to live in peace. Our hearts are broken over the endless lines of refugees fleeing their homes with their families and only what they can put in a suitcase, realizing that they may never be going back to their home again. Uh, we're outraged and confused over the seeming inability of nations, including our own, to forcefully stand up to this kind of international bullying that's going on. This gets to you. It gets to me. Where do we turn? Like the psalmist, we need to turn to God. We must cry out to him in our pain and confusion. He knows. He cares. He listens to the cries of those in distress. He wants us to trust him. So listen as I read Psalm 10. I think it really is applicable to the situation today. And this is a prayer. Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? <clears throat> Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In pride, the wicked hotly pursue the afflicted. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire, and the greedy man curses and spurns the Lord. The wicked in the haughtiness of his countenance does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high, out of his sight. As for all his adversaries, he snorts at them. He says to himself, I shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, I shall not be in adversity. His mouth is full of curses and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is mischief and wickedness. He sits in the lurking places of the villages 
In the hiding places, he kills the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the unfortunate. He lurks in a hiding place as a lion in his lair. He lurks to catch the afflicted. He catches the afflicted when he draws them into his net. He crouches, he bows down, and the unfortunate fall by his mighty ones. He says to himself, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the afflicted. Why has the wicked spurned God? He has said to himself, you will not require it. You have seen it, for you have beheld mischief and vexation to take it into your hand. The unfortunate commits himself to you. You have been the helper of the orphan. Break the arm of the wicked and the evildoer. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. Nations have perished from his land. O Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to vindicate the orphan and the oppressed, that man who is of the earth may cause terror no more. Father, it's amazing how this psalm speaks to our situation today. And we cry out to you, Father, in our anger, in our frustration, in our discouragement, in our confusion. God, we cry out to you. We know you see it all. We know you understand it all better than we do. And we just commit this whole situation to you, Father, and to your wise and holy purposes. Father, as your church, as your people, we thank you that we can turn to you on behalf of others who are suffering, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ in both Ukraine and in Russia. As with Solomon, Father, I pray that you would give the Ukrainian leaders and all leaders in these difficult times wisdom from above. As David prayed, Father, I ask you to show yourself strong as Ukraine faces their Goliath. I'm asking that the world will see that some trust in chariots, others in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord, our God. Like Daniel prayed, Father, I pray that you will remove the leaders who mock you. I pray that Putin would fear and see the writing on the wall as did that wicked king in Daniel chapter five. Father, as with the believers here locally and around the world, continue to show us what we can do individually and collectively to help alleviate the suffering of our brothers and sisters in Ukraine. May they see those outside the faith, may those and those outside the faith see Jesus in us as we seek to love one another and serve one another. Father, as we close this time of prayer, we are confident that prayer on behalf of kings and all of those in high positions is pleasing to you. For you desire all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Thank you for Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. It's in his name, the name above all names, that we pray. Amen. You know, for new parents, one of the things that can be hard is trying to figure out what you're going to name uh, the child that's on the way. And uh, I remember when my wife and I, we had our first, we were pregnant with our first child. Uh, we, we had a real hard time figuring out what girl name we both liked and, and wanted to, to name her. Uh, she had a list of girl names in her mind of, uh, that she liked, and I was just kind of like, eh for most, for pretty much all of the ones she liked. And then I had a list of names I put out that I liked, girl names that I thought were nice. And she was kind of like, nah, for, for all of those. And so, 
you know, then you've, we've got these different criteria. It's like sometimes you like the name, but you don't like the nickname that you're sure people will call them if you name them that. And so we kind of straight, stayed away from some of those names. Sometimes you like a name, but you've kind of recently come to know somebody else or somebody else's kid that has that name, and you don't really care for them that much. And so you're like, oh, they just kind of remind me of them. So you stay away from that name, and it can be really hard. Then sometimes you find a name, and you like it, and you think you know what you're going to name them, and maybe you don't even tell anybody. It's a secret. And then suddenly some cousin or some friend of yours has a child, and they name them the very thing you were planning to name yours, and, well, you don't want it to look like you're copying them. So, you know, there's all these different criteria that we sometimes think about. Well, when, when we were, again, wrestling with what name to name our first one, we were kind of going through all of those things, and we were having a hard time. We finally bought this name uh, this book of names some of you may have done that and so we you know at night time we'd go through and we'd read several pages and and occasionally we'd highlight one there oh that's a maybe and then we came across you know the name that we ended up landing on Eliana and uh, and it kind of fit all of the criteria that we had set up there at the beginning that we talked about you know we wanted a name that was not so unique that nobody would kind of know how to spell it or think about it but was also not that common at that time. Um, and as we look to see what the names meant, as the, the book of names gives you, what, what kind of also really struck us that not only did we like the name, but, but it had a Hebrew origin. And it, it mentioned that, you know, in Hebrew, it means God has answered. And uh, we thought, well, that's kind of neat because we had been praying that we could have children. And it had been a couple of years that we had been praying for that. And we were beginning to wonder whether that was you know, uh, in our future at all, and so it felt like an appropriate name as well because of the significance and the meaning behind it. And so, you know, names are important. And most of us recognize that. Most people take a lot of thought, and they, they put a lot of thought into what they're going to name their children because of the importance and the significance that those names will, for most, carry with them throughout their lives. Well, in Isaiah chapter 7, in the first half of chapter 8 this morning, we see three children's names, or at least three names of children that are significant to the storyline. They, ha they have great significance. The meaning of them was meant to teach something about God. They are prophetically significant names. And each of them serve a message from God to Judah. In fact, each of them are, are said to be signs Signs by God, they were meant to communicate a, a, a message from God and that any time somebody looked at those, those children, they would remember something that God was, was trying to tell them. Now, really, each one of these children's names, they, they really kind of come back to the same point. It's not like they're three totally distinct messages from God, as we'll see as we work through these, these verses. It's really one primary message that God is trying to get across. And I've summed it up sort of the thesis of the message in this way. It's always wise to trust in God, even when it seems from your earthly vantage point that there are better options. It's always wise, and it's always right, and it always makes sense to trust God and to obey Him, even from when from our earthly vantage points, it seems like there's better options. It seems like it makes better sense to kind of go over here and do my thing and, and disobey, that it's actually always best to trust in Him. Well, Isaiah chapter 7, if you've not already turned there, turn to Isaiah chapter 7, and we're just going to read the first couple verses to get started here in, in Isaiah chapter 7. It says, In the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Retzin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the son of Romalia, the king of Israel, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it. But they could not yet mount an attack against it. When the house of David was told, Syria is in league with Ephraim, the heart of Ahaz and the heart of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake before the wind. Now, right there in verse 1, we're kind of bombarded with all of these names of people, and it's, it's kind of confusing from the get-go. And so, just sort of just to lay out there, you've really got four kings that, that these, this whole passage is going to revolve around. Three of them are named here. But the first one is King Ahaz, and he's the king of Judah, and of course he reigns in Jerusalem. And what, partly what also makes this confusing is these kings are not always referred to in the same way as we go throughout this passage. 
They're oftentimes referred to in slightly different ways. So you kind of keep coming back to your mind, which one was this? Who were they? So again, Ahaz is the king over Judah, the southern tribes, and he's headquartered in Jerusalem, the city that he's identified with as Jerusalem. And then you have Retzin, who's the king of Syria, or some translations, the king of Aram. And his central city where he's located, the capital is Damascus. So again, sometimes he's referred to as Retzin, sometimes the king of Syria or Aram, and sometimes it even just uses the term Damascus to refer to him or his people. And then you have Israel, the northern tribes, and they're ruled by a guy named Pekah. And, and usually it refers to him as Ephraim or Samaria. Again, Ephraim was the most significant tribe amongst the northern tribes. And so sometimes he's referred to as the king of Assyria or just, I'm sorry, the king of Ephraim or just Ephraim. And then other times Samaria being the capital, he's referred to as Samaria. And and then to make it even worse, he's oftentimes just referred to as the son of Ramalia. Because that's who Pekah was. He was the son of Ramalia, we're told here. And it's almost like maybe it's a dig by the prophet to not even give him his name. Just to call him, oh, he's the son of Ramalia because he's kind of illegitimate as the king of Israel. So again, if you can kind of keep those three in order, they're going to come up over and over and over again throughout this passage. But it's really these three people or these three nations, the nation of Judah, the nation of Syria, and the nation of Israel. And then fourthly, he's going to be unnamed in the Isaiah passages, but the king of Assyria is going to come up. And he might be unnamed throughout the Isaiah passages because it's actually more than one king. It actually extends over enough period of time that two different people, two different kings function as the king of Assyria. But Isaiah just refers to him generically as Assyria or the king of Assyria. So we've got these four characters to keep in mind. And you've got this this scenario that's unfolding that basically Assyria has been on the rise as a nation, uh, as a political power. And so the the surrounding nations, which are weaker than them, are are kind of beginning to posture and figure out what to do to try to prevent what what could be a takeover by Assyria. And so specifically, you have Retzim, the king of Syria, and Pekah, or Pekah rather, the king of Israel, and they make an alliance together. And they join together, and they decide that we're going to form this alliance, and we're going to try to together uh, be stronger and hopefully be able to ward off Assyria. And they wanted Judah to join with them. They wanted Ahaz and the, and the nation of Judah to combine with them and to become stronger. And so apparently they had approached Ahaz and said, hey, join with us, be, become part of our coalition." But as Ahaz began to think about it, and, and he thought about the ramifications, he decided not to combine with those two nations, but rather to align himself with Assyria, their enemy. He had decided, well, Assyria is the powerful one. Why don't I just align myself with them? Why don't I cozy up with Assyria, become friends with Assyria, and then I'll be safer? That that was sort of his bed. And so that did not sit well with Retzim and Pekah. And so they decide, well, then we're going to attack you. So they decide that then their coalition, they're going to come up and they're going to attack Judah. And part of why they were going to do that, we'll find out a little bit later here in these early verses, is because they had, um, there's this other guy that they had apparently uh, conspired with that they were going to set up as the king of Judah, somebody who had agreed already that he would join with them. And so this was their way of getting their bigger coalition to get Judah and their military to be a part of them as they'll just go in, attack, take over, and they'll put their own king in place, someone who will be friendly to them. So this is what they do. They join together and they attack. And what we see is that initially, we don't see it directly here in Isaiah, but elsewhere in in, uh, the Chronicles, we see that they're actually quite successful. These two uh, nations come together, they attack Judah, and they they, uh, successfully conquer a whole bunch of cities. 2 Chronicles chapter 28, verses 5 through 8, it says this, Therefore the Lord his God, Ahaz, gave him, Ahaz, into the hand of the king of Syria, who defeated him and took captive a great number of his people. He was also given into the hand of the king of Israel, who struck him with great force. For Pekah killed 120,000 from Judah in one day. The men of Israel took captive 200,000 of their relatives, women, sons, and daughters. They also took much spoil from them. 
So these two kings, the king of Syria, the king of uh, Israel, join together. They go ahead and they attack Judah, and they're successful in many of the cities. But they've come basically up to Jerusalem, and they're about ready to surround it and besiege it. And this is where Ahaz is now sort of the moment of, of decision. What am I going to do? Am I going to surrender? Am I going to fight? And, and, uh, and this is where we're at at the beginning of Isaiah chapter 7. Now, Ahaz, historically, has just become king at this time. In fact, he's 20 years old. He's 20 years old. He's, he's a very young man. He's just become king. He's not very experienced. And you can understand under these circumstances, as he's looked around and he's seen his nation, uh, you know, gradually be given over to uh, these, these two kings to the north who are in coalition against him. And, and he's beginning to assume, I'm next. I'm going to be killed the city that I live in is going to be taken over. What do I do? And so verses 3 through 9. This is where the Lord speaks to Ahaz through Isaiah. Verse 3. And the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out to meet Ahaz, you and Shear Yashuv, your son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the washer's field, and say to him, Be careful. Be quiet. Do not fear. And do not let your heart be faint because of these two smoldering stumps of firebrands at the fierce anger of Retzin and Syria and the son of Romalia. Because Syria with Ephraim and the son of Romalia has devised evil against you, saying, Let us go up against Judah and terrify it, and let us conquer it for ourselves and set up the son of Tabil as king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, and it shall not come to pass. For the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Ratzin. And within 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered from being a people. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Romalia. If you are not firm in faith, you will not be firm at all. So basically, God sends Isaiah up to Ahaz, he meets him out at this pool, the upper pool. He's likely inspecting the city's water supply, basically trying to figure out how much time do we have if, if as these two people have come and they're about ready to, to surround us and put a siege on us, how much time do we have? How long can we hold out? He's inspecting this water supply, and, and it's at this time that the prophet Isaiah comes, and he was told to bring with him his son. Well, that's interesting. Why is he supposed to bring his son? And we're told his son's name, and, and we're told that his son's name is Sha'ar She'ar Yashuv. This is his son's name. And it means a remnant will return. In other words, the name of the son fits the message that God has for him. Namely, that Assyria is going to be unsuccessful. They're not going to be able to destroy you. In fact, not Assyria, Syria and Israel are going to be unsuccessful. They're not going to be able to defeat you as you trust in me. In fact, a, only a remnant of them will return. That's the meaning of the name, that a small amount of these ones who have come up against you, against you are going to go home because they're going to get defeated. Only a few of them are going to be left to go home. Only a remnant of them are actually going to return back to their homeland. And so he says, be quiet. Do not be afraid. Only Trust in me. Verse 8 says, in 65 years, Ephraim, or Israel, would be shattered as a people. Their, their future is short. But verse 9, he says, and this is the condition, he says, however, if Ahaz isn't firm in his face, that faith, that is, if he doesn't fully trust in God in this moment, he will not be firm at all. That is, he will not be secure. His safety, his security, his salvation is dependent on where does he put his faith? Is he going to put his faith in God? And the promise that he's being given right now from Isaiah, as indicated through the name of this son of Isaiah that he's brought along with him, or is he going to look elsewhere? So we look in verses 10 and 11. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or as high as the heavens. In other words, he says to him, look, so that you can have confidence that what I am saying to you will in fact come to pass, ask whatever you want. 
You ask a sign of me. Ask some miraculous thing. Ask some great act by me, and I'll do it. I'll do it to prove to you, to convince you, to put your heart at ease, to put it at rest, that I will, in fact, do as I say. I mean, that's a pretty amazing invitation. Don't you agree? I mean, if, imagine if God had said to you that some enemy of yours or some situation that you were facing, some crisis that you were in the midst of, if God had sent a prophet to you and said, it's going gonna, it's gonna to turn out okay, here's how it's going to turn out. And in fact, so that you can believe it, ask me to do whatever you want. Whatever you want, as high as heaven, as low as the grave, ask anything and I'll do it for you. I mean, that is a spectacular invitation that Ahaz has been given, a great opportunity. I mean, he could have said, okay, here's what I want. I mean, I want there to be some miraculous lightning strikes that destroys all of the, all of the armies that are, that are out there right now. I want to see it with my own eyes. Could have, could have happened. He, he could have asked for, for some other great way in which he could see not only those armies, but maybe a serious too, this one that is, you know, a geopolitical threat right now. He could have, he could have asked for all of them to have heart attacks and, and fall over and die, or, or some great thing that would have convinced him, whatever it took, for his heart to be convinced, he could have asked for it. But what does he say in verse 12? Oh, the pious Ahaz. Verse 12. I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Now, Ahaz was not this righteous guy. We don't have time to look into his history, but if you look at some of the stories in Kings and Chronicles, this was a guy who, who, who went and sought out pagan idol temple um, altars, and he, and he had the measurements taken so he could bring them back to the altar in the temple of Israel in Jerusalem so that he could mimic it because he was so impressed by these other idolatrous altars. This is a guy who is specifically mentioned as one who offered his own child on a, to, to sacrifice him to pagan gods. This is not a, a, a righteous guy, but here he talks all pious. Well, I'm not going to put God to the test, quoting from Deuteronomy where, you know, it tells us not to put God to the test. God's invited him to test him in this context. God's the one that said, I want to do this for you. I want to give you a sign. What do you want from me? And he says, no, thank you. Now, apparently, he had already determined he's not trusting in Yahweh. He's trusting in Assyria. He's already determined that his alliance is going to be with Assyria. That's where his faith is. He believes Assyria is where it's at. They're the ones that are going to be his savior. They're the ones he's going to trust in. And thus, he's basically said to God, no, thank you. And so we see in 2 Kings chapter 15, verses 5 through 8, then Retzin, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the king of Israel, came up to wage war on Jerusalem, and they besieged Ahaz. So Ahaz sent messengers to, to Tiglath-Pileser, the king of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your son. Come up and rescue me from the hand of the king of Syria and from the hand of the king of Israel who are attacking me. Ahaz also took the silver and the gold that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house, and he sent a present to the king of Assyria. He has made his decision. My savior is Assyria. The one who's going to help me, the one who I'm going to put my faith and trust in, it's Assyria. He's the powerful one. He's the one that can help me. And that's where he turned. That's what he decided. No, thank you, God. I think I'm going to trust over here. And so what happens? Verses 13 through 25. And he said, here then, this is the prophet now speaking to Ahaz, hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as has not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. In that day, the Lord will whistle for the fly that is at the end of the streams of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. And they will all come and settle in the steep ravines and in the clefts of the rocks and on the thorn bushes and on all the, pa and on all the pastures. 
In that day, the Lord will shave with a razor that is hired beyond the river with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the feet, and it will sweep away the beard also. In that day, a man will keep alive a young cow and two sheep, and because of the abundance of milk that they give, he will eat curds, for everyone who is left in the land will eat curds and honey. In that day, every place where there used to be a thousand vines worth a thousand shekels of silver will become briars and thorns. With bow and arrows, a man will come there, for all the land will be briars and thorns. And as for all the hills that used to be hoed with a hoe, you will not come there for fear of briars and thorns. And they will become a place where cattle are let loose and where sheep tread. You got a lot going on here in this promise. But essentially, what we see is that there's a second child that is promised. Another child who will be a sign. Another child whose name is going to have a prophetically significant meaning or impact on this. Child number two is Emmanuel, whose name means God is with us. Now, when most of you hear those verses and you hear Emmanuel, God with us, you immediately think of what? Christmas time, right? Think of Matthew, and in Matthew's gospel, he refers to this prophecy and he says it's fulfilled by Jesus. Now, we don't have time this morning to, to look at Matthew's account and, and in what sense Matthew is saying that this prophecy was fulfilled in Jesus. But just understand this this morning, and, and I hope that this will become clear. In Isaiah's day, the immediate prophecy that was given to them was not talking about Jesus. It was talking about somebody that was going to be born at that time because its significance had to do with the very near future. In fact, the prophecy specifically says before this boy is very old, before he's even old enough to discern good and evil, these two kings that you fear, Syria and Israel, the kings of Syria and Israel, they're going to be gone. And so this was something that was going to be fulfilled in Isaiah's day. So Matthew, whatever he means... When he talks about Jesus as the fulfillment, it's a different type of fulfillment than what we oftentimes think of as this prophecy that, that basically predicts something's going to happen, and then there's this one thing that happens, and that's the fulfillment. That is not what Matthew means uh, when, when he talks about Jesus being the fulfillment of the prophecy. I hope that doesn't throw more confusion than explanation, but for purposes this morning, I don't have time to really get into that, other than to say, don't be anticipating me talking about Jesus as the fulfillment of this, because that's not what the immediate fulfillment was intended to be. In verse 14, the prophecy says that a virgin will conceive, and the Hebrew word for virgin here in Isaiah is the Hebrew word alma. Alma does not mean virgin in the technical sense that we typically use it in our day and age. And even the Greek word that Matthew used meant something a little more precise and specific. That meant a woman who had never been with a man. Virgin in Alma, this Hebrew word is more general. It just means a young woman. Not only Alma, but a couple of the words that are sort of linguistically related to it, they all refer to age, not sexual involvement in, in one's past. They all refer to a young woman. It's a, a, a youth or a young adult female is what the word means. And in the context, he's likely talking about some young woman who was pregnant at the time or was about to become pregnant who would have this child and they were to name him Emmanuel or they would name him Emmanuel. Probably it was a woman that was known to Ahaz. In fact, he, he uses the direct article, the, to refer to her. It's not just a virgin would conceive, the virgin would conceive, the young woman is going to conceive. Likely somebody that Ahab, Ahaz, in, in the context, knew exactly who he was talking about. So it was probably either somebody within Ahaz's royal court, one of his own wives, who was pregnant, who was going to have this child, and Isaiah is saying, this this virgin, this young woman who's about to give birth for you uh, is going to have this child, and you should name him Emmanuel. Or it's possibly Isaiah's own wife who's going to have a child, the prophetess, as she's going to be called later in this passage. And it was his own wife who was about to have a child who was to be called Emmanuel. Either way, it's somebody that Ahaz knows, and this child is going to be a sign to him in some way. 
Verse 16, before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. In other words, before he's old enough to even know right from wrong. He's going to be an infant still. He's not even going to be old enough to understand what good and bad uh, evil and righteousness is. While he's still very young, while he's still an infant, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. Their lands, not only are they going to be defeated, their whole land's going to be deserted. They're going to be deported out of their own land. Both Syria's and Israel's kings would be defeated and their people deported. Thus, they would no longer be a threat to Ahaz and to Judah. Now, when that happened, because what history bears out very shortly after this, Assyria is going to come up in response to Ahaz sending gifts to Assyria. Assyria is going to take those gifts and say, okay. And he's going to come up and he's going to do and wage, he's going to wage war against Syria And Israel, and he's going to be successful. He's going to defeat them. He's going to deport them out of their own lands. This prophecy is going to be fulfilled rather quickly. And the temptation for Ahaz is to say, look how smart I was. Look look at the good job I did. Good thing I didn't trust God. Good thing I went and I conspired with Assyria. Good thing I got him on my side. It worked out to my advantage. And then there's this child. God is with us. God is with us. Every time he sees this child, again, either his own or probably Isaiah's child, that that he was told this child's name is going to be a constant sign or a reminder to you. God is with us. He's going to be put in front of his face. No, it was actually God who did that, not Assyria. No, it was God who did that. No, God should be credited with that. And he's going to have to wrestle with that reality because, as it goes on to say, very quickly things are going to turn and Assyria is going to turn on him. This one who initially he's going to be tempted to think was his savior, his hero, the one who defeated his two enemies for him. And God is saying, no, it was actually me. He's going to turn on him. And he's going to come up against Judah. And he's going to inflict on Judah as well a time such as they hadn't seen since the time when Israel and Judah split. That's what it says in verse 17. It says, The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah. And what is it going to look like? The king of Assyria. He's going to bring Assyria up on you and it's going to cause a time like you have never had before going all the way back to the time when the two of you guys split. And then in the verses that follow, you've got this repeated In that day, in that day, four times. Verses 18 and 19, in that day, God's going to whistle. And Assyria is going to come. It's it's like a guy who goes out and he whistles for some animal of his, and that animal comes running. That's how how God describes what he's going to do in that day. He's going to go out and he's going to whistle, and Assyria is going to come running. In other words, Assyria... Yes, Assyria is the one that defeated these two kings for you, but that was me. That was the sovereign God behind the scenes orchestrating it. But then when Assyria comes and turns on you, also me. I'm whistling and he's coming. Verse 20, again, in that day the Assyrians are going to come and they are going to shame you. It says specifically they're going to shave the heads of the men, including their beards and including their feet. He's talking about things that would have been very shameful for them. And if I can, again, just be not trying to be callous here or anything else, but the feet were oftentimes a euphemism. I mentioned this, I think it was last week, for the genitals. And that's what's going on here. He's not talking about the hair on their feet. He's talking about something else. He's basically saying these guys are going to come and they're going to embarrass you. They're going to take your men and make them look like little boys. They're going to do things that emasculate them so that they feel ashamed and embarrassed. They're going to be shamed. These Assyrians, these ones you put your hope and your trust in, they're going to come back and shame you and embarrass you. Verse 20. Verses 21 and 22. Those who were left in Judah would eat this limited diet of honey and curdled milk. Why? Why? Well, because the land's going to be devastated. Briars and thorns growing everywhere. And so they're not going to have their normal balanced diet of fruits and vegetables and grains. They're going to be limited to to other things because briars and thorns, verses 23 through 25, in that day are going to overtake all of the vineyards, all of the farmland, all of the hills. It's going to be a mess. The point is, is they were tempted. They, They would be tempted to trust that somehow... Because very early on, initially, it looks like his decision to reject God's call, trust me, 
Put your faith and trust in me. Now, I got a better option over here. And initially, it's going to look like that was the better option. It's going to look like it worked for him. Oh, yeah, things are working out really good because I'm making this choice. And he's going to be tempted to think, sort of be solidified in that decision. And God says, don't go there. In fact, here's this constant reminder, this boy that is named God is with us as a reminder that I'm supposed to be the one you put your trust in. I'm with you. I'm supposed to be the one that is your help, and you rejected it. And so God with us is kind of a twofold meaning. <coughs> and we'll see this at the end as well because it comes back to this meaning of Emmanuel two more times in chapter 8. And it's, it's a double meaning. God is with us. He's the one who is our help. He's the one who is our protection. He is our savior as he was for Ahaz. But he's also the one that brings judgment. He's also the one who disciplines when, they, when he rejects. And so what does God with us mean? Well, verse 16, it's an assurance that God is going to do as he promised, that these two nations would be unsuccessful, that God would keep them from defeating Jerusalem. But it would also be the reminder of his judgment, his presence in judgment in the verses that followed. You know, I, I think as we just think about how this applies to us in our life, I mean, how many times Christians will find themselves in a place where they feel desperate. They, they feel like they don't have any good options. They know that the, God's word calls them to, to obey in a certain way, to, to do uh, certain things that, that please God. But it just feels like, man, if I do that, I'm giving so much up. If I do that, I, I'd, I'd have to Im, 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 invite so much suffering, possibly. Uh, just think of a couple hypothetical scenarios. I mean, scenario number one, imagine a husband who... A father and a husband who loses his job. And, uh, and he had a decent job, paid well, lived in a decent house, uh, was taking care of his family. They, they felt like things were going well, and then just out of nowhere, he loses his job. And he has tried quite a bit to find another job to replace that one. He's put out uh, resumes. He's talked to people and just have nothing. There seems to be nothing available in his field, nothing that he seems to be qualified for that he can apply for, and all of the jobs that are available pay peanuts compared to what he was making. Maybe even on top of that, maybe he's got a, a child who who's depends on a certain medication every month, and now that he's lost his job, he's lost his, some of his health insurance benefits, and he can't even afford that medication, and so now they're trying to figure out how to take care of their child, and he feels guilty, like it's his fault that his son or daughter is suffering, and, and, and he feels like he's got to do something for that situation. The house that they live in, they're no longer been able to pay their mortgage. They, they've tried working things out with the bank, and the bank is kind of being patient with them for a bit, but they know in, in a very short period of time they're going to lose their house if something doesn't change. Well, in the midst of this, a friend comes and says, hey, I think I've got a solution to your problems. I've got a job that you can do. And here's what it pays. And wow, it pays as much or even maybe more than what he had been getting paid. But there's a catch, he says. I, you, need to, you need to be able to take half of your pay in cash kind of under the table. Like we don't turn this in for taxes. And you can't ask questions why. Other than that, it's a great opportunity for you. What do you think? Well, here he is, you know, and, and he's been looking for all these ways to fix his problems. He's been praying about it. Nothing else has, has, has come up. And now here's this opportunity and all he has to do, he knows it's not ethical. He knows that, that it's a form of defrauding the government, but you know, it wasn't his idea. He's not the one who's insisting on it. It's the guy who's giving him the job. And, and you can imagine all of the thoughts that go through his mind as he tries to justify taking that opportunity. What's he do? Maybe consider another scenario. Think of, a, of a, a, maybe a, a mom, single mom, three young kids. Her husband recently abandoned the family for somebody else. She had never anticipated being the breadwinner, and now she's trying to figure out how to support her and her kids. And so the three of them end up having to leave the house that they were in, and they end up moving into an apartment somewhere. And it's not a very nice area of town. Maybe it's a shady area of town. And uh, it's not a very nice apartment, but it's what they can afford. The walls are very thin, and, and next door on the one side, the, the people are always loud, and they're always getting into arguments, and they're kind of vulgar, and they hear it through the walls, and their kids are hearing this, and it's, they're trying to go to sleep at night, and they've got these loud, angry, arguing, vulgar neighbors on the one side. 
And on the other side, she's pretty sure that individual's into drugs and selling drugs because people are coming at all times of the day and of the evening, and, and she's heard rumors that, that that's what's going on. And so she's con just concerned about the environment now, the community where her kids are, are being brought up in and all the stuff that they're hearing. And as a single woman, she finds herself being fearful a lot, especially at night when, when there's noises in the house and she, she's concerned, is, is somebody, somebody broken in? Is someone trying to break in? And she feels vulnerable and scared. And in the course of all of this, she meets a really nice man. And this really nice man, well, he's got a good job. He cares for her. He's nice to her kids. He's got a nice house. The problem is, he doesn't even profess to be a believer. He's not a believer at all, but he's a nice guy. And at this point, they're just friends, but she can tell he would like to marry her. And she begins to think, boy, what would it be like if I married him, how would this solve so many of my problems? What should I do? Because the truth is, desperate people are tempted to do desperate things. They're tempted to make decisions that in the moment it feels like this fixes everything. This one decision would fix all of these problems. And God says, trust me. And we say, trust you. How does trusting you get me out of any of these things? And God says, trust me. Obey. You see, in the above scenarios, I mean, we, we could consider, I mean, we could go further and consider the, the, you know, the ramifications if either of those two individuals make that compromising decision. It, in the moment, and maybe in the months that followed, everything would appear to get better. Circumstances would get better. But it wouldn't be all that hard to think through years down the road some of the ramifications of those sinful choices. I mean, both of them are making some decisions because of their concern for their kids. But what about the spiritual implications of a parent who now basically says it's okay to compromise in order to fix life situations? Yeah, my faith in God isn't that serious. What are the spiritual implications for the kids years down the road when they've seen mom or dad make those compromises? What does it say to them? Yeah, faith in God is kind of a when it's convenient sort of a thing. Do they walk away from faith? Do they say, yeah, it's pointless? What about those adults and their own relationship with God? Does it begin to unravel? I mean, as they make these major compromising just choices in their own life, the, the, the sense of guilt, the feelings of this is wrong, the need to repent, but I'm kind of in too deep. Now what? How does it affect their own spiritual life? Does it begin to unravel in the years to come? And the point is, and, and part of the point that God is trying to make in this passage is it might look tempting on the surface not to trust me to trust your own intuition and in your own good judgment but i promise you in the end it's always worth it to trust in god even when from a human vantage point from a human standpoint it seems like i've got better options there's never a better option than continuing to trust god and ahaz's refusal to trust in god's promises are going to cause him and judah to forfeit a whole bunch of blessings that could have been theirs and I wonder how many blessings we forfeit when we take the easy path of least resistance, even though it's rebellion against God. Well, this passage essentially concludes in chapter 8 with one more prophetically significant child's name. Chapter 8, verses 1 through 10, let me just read, <coughs> read it to you. Then the Lord said to me, take a large tablet and write on it in common characters. Belonging to Maher Shalal Hashbaz. And I will get reliable witnesses, Uriah the priest and Zechariah, the son of um, Jeberechiah, to attest for me. And I went to the prophetess, the prophet's wife. Isaiah goes into his wife, to the prophetess, and she conceived and she bore a son. Then the Lord said to me, call his name Maher Shalal Hashbaz. Now, I don't know if any of you are, you know, having a boy soon, but here's a name. I have no idea what the nickname would be for that one. You know, Hashbazi, or I really don't know. But either way, that's a big one. For before the boy, verse 4, for before the boy knows how to cry, my father or my mother, the wealth of Damascus, Syria, and the spoil of Samaria, Israel, will be carried away before the king of Assyria. 
the Lord spoke to me again, because this people has refused the waters of Shiloh that flow gently, and they rejoice over Retzin and the son of Ramalia. Therefore, behold, the Lord is bringing up against them the waters of the river, mighty and many, the king of Assyria, and all of his glory. And it will rise over all its channels and go over all of its banks, and it will sweep on into Judah, and it will overflow and pass on, reaching even to the neck. And its outspread wings will fill the breadth of your land, O Emmanuel. Be broken, you peoples, and be shattered. Give ear, all you far countries. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. Speak a word, but it will not stand. For God is with us. Well, we've got one more child here. Again, we were told specifically this is Isaiah's son. He and his wife are about to have this child. This long name, Meher Shalal Hashbaz, meant hurrying to collect the spoil or rushing to get the plunder. And again, in context, it's pretty clear it is a reference to the fact that Damascus and Samaria, or Israel and Syria, were about to be defeated, their people deported, and it was going to leave behind a whole bunch of spoil for the Assyrians to rush in and get. The Assyrians were going to rush in and plunder all of the possessions and the wealth left behind by the Syrians and the Israelites when they were defeated and deported. And so his enemies were going to lose this battle by the Assyrians, and they were going to rush in and plunder everything. Again, this name was meant to convey, you should have trusted me, because your enemies aren't going to be there for long. Their stuff's going to be plundered. You should have trusted me. And so he creates this very public ceremony, likely, because he, he calls two known public officials, a priest and a prophet, Uriah the priest, Zechariah the prophet, Zechariah being a contemporary of Isaiah, he calls these two well-known individuals to come and witness the signing of this, of this name in this, some public document, Maher Shalal Hashbaz, which was basically a, a, to let the people know God's predicting months or years before it's happened that your enemies are going to be defeated and their places are going to be plundered. You should have trusted in him. Verse 4, before the boy knows how to cry, Dada, Mama, Father, Mother, before he's old enough to even say his first words, the wealth of Damascus, the spoil of Samaria, would be plundered by the Assyrians. God's basically saying, you wouldn't believe me, your, your leaders wouldn't believe me. Here is a public document that stands as a testament against them. You should have trusted in me because God is with you. He says, your land, O Emmanuel, verse 8, he comes back to that name, Emmanuel, in verse 8. Only here it seems like it's a, a reference to the, the people of Judah as a whole. He refers to them and their land as Emmanuel, the place where God was with them. They were God's people. He was with them. And once again, I'm not going to, well, he uses the analogy of, of water in verses 5 through 8. And he talks about, you know, streams of water, which provided uh, for people. They, they sustained life. You know, water is essential to life. You look for it to, to provide for you drinking water. It, it helps the crops to grow. It was used for transportation. It was um, a very necessary element of life. And he describes himself as the, the waters of Shiloh. It was probably a, a gentle stream that fed into Jerusalem. And he metaphorically describes himself like that stream, this gentle spring of water which would have provided and, and, and been security and safety and, and, and provided for their needs. They should have trusted in him. But instead, they looked to the mighty, strong river of Assyria. And so they're going to get what they wanted. They wanted the mighty and strong, raging rivers of Assyria. Well, those rivers came in and washed away their enemies, but then they're going to overflow their, their banks. And that water is going to spread even into Judah. In fact, it's going to come all the way to Jerusalem, all the way up to the necks of the people. Essentially, God's saying, it's not going to destroy you. And we'll see in the future weeks uh, what takes place when this comes to a head. Essentially, they're going to lose. God's not going to let Assyria totally conquer his people in Jerusalem, but they're going to wreak a lot of havoc. And so again, the, the same name, it's sort of redundant of what's already been said, the prediction. They should have trusted in me. 
Because the Syrians, the one they're putting their faith in, is ultimately going to turn on them. You know, you've, you've all seen rivers and what happens when there's a flood. And, and you, you've seen, I've got pictures here of, of, of the, the devastation that can come when there's a massive flood. Homes that are totally destroyed. Water's a great thing. It's a necessary thing. It's a helpful thing. But when it overflows its banks, it's also it's quite unpredictable at times. And when it overflows its banks, it can be totally destructive. It, it reaches its own level. This is the analogies God is using of Assyria. Yes, you think that they're helpful, but they're quite unpredictable. If you put your trust in things other than God, it's quite unpredictable. You think you can control it. You think you can use it to kind of help you and provide for your needs. But it will very quickly get out of control and destroy you. And so what happened, 2 Chronicles 28, 19 to 21, for the Lord humbled Judah because of Ahaz, king of Israel. For he had made Judah act sinfully, Ahaz did, and had been very unfaithful to the Lord. So tiglath pileser king of Assyria, came against him and afflicted him instead of strengthening him. For Ahaz took a portion from the house of the Lord and the house of the king and of the princes and gave tribute to the king of Assyria. But what? But it did not help him. These things that he thought were going to secure him, were going to provide for him what he needed in the end. He, he thought that, that Assyria was going to strengthen him, but instead it afflicted him. He thought it was going to help him, but in the end, it didn't help him. This is the reality of all who attempt to look elsewhere besides the Lord for their security and their safety. There was a movie uh, that came out in 2020 entitled I Still Believe in It. Um, it's the story of Jeremy Camp. I don't know how many of you are Jeremy Camp fans, uh, uh, Christian musicians, written quite a few songs. Well, anyways, the movie's about his life because when he was in college, he met his first wife, Melissa. Uh, and, and the two of them began to date. And while they were dating in college, she was diagnosed with a severe form of cancer. And it did not look good at all. And they just began to pray, and they began to recruit a whole bunch of other people to pray on her behalf. And miraculously, God healed her. And the cancer was gone. And they rejoiced, and they, they celebrated. They had worship services celebrating how God had healed his girlfriend and, and then eventually his wife-to-be of cancer. And so the two of them got engaged. They got married. And very shortly after they were married, like a week into their marriage, suddenly she realized the cancer had returned. And it very quickly killed her. Three months later, she died at the age of 21 from cancer. And so, again, if you're familiar with Jeremy Camp's songs, you'll notice that several of his songs, especially his most popular ones, kind of reflect on the, the realities behind that, that period of life. And what, you know, can I really trust this God? This God who, who I thought he healed, and then all of a sudden she's gone. One of those songs in particular kind of sums up the message of this passage. It's called Walk by Faith. It says this, Would I believe you when you say, Your hand will guide my every way? Will I receive the words you say every moment of every day? And then the refrain is, I will walk by faith, even when I cannot see, because this broken road prepares your will for me. The second verse says, help me to win my endless fears. You've been so faithful for all my years. With one breath, you make me new. Your grace covers all that I do. I will walk by faith, even when I cannot see, because this broken road prepares your will for me. I am broken, but I still see your face. You have spoken, pouring your words of grace. Praise team is going to come and lead us in one final song of worship to our Lord. All right, welcome. Would you please stand with us as we continue to worship the Lord?
Thank you very much for worshiping with us. Peace be with you as you go into this world and follow after the heart of the Lord. You're dismissed.